Hello, my name is Bonnie Conda. I'm from the Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, and we are here in Vienna at ISDE 2018. And I'm uh, joined by our wonderful panelists. Gary Falk from the University of Pennsylvania. Ken Wang from Mayo Clinic, Rochester. Pratik Sharma from Kansas City. And Peter Siesma from Morocco University in the Netherlands. And our first topic for our panel discussion is on screening and diagnosis for Barrett's esophagus. So Gary, I'll start with you. Please share with us what you think are the current challenges for screening and diagnosis in the population today for Barrett's esophagus. So screening, the issues I think are two, namely who do you screen and how do you screen? I think when it comes to who do you screen, we're very primitive still because we're targeting uh, the highest at-risk patients, which are middle-aged or older white men who are obese and smoke and have reflux. But unfortunately, that doesn't cover all the people who have Barrett's. We know from the old Ligogram data from uh, back in the 1990s that uh, about 40% of people with esophageal adenocarcinoma don't recall reflux. So using reflux as the ticket to screening, which we use, is a primitive tool to be able to use. At the same time, if you look at people who are obese and have other risk factors and don't have reflux, uh, it becomes untenable. So we don't really have uh, anything other than very broad brush stroke type of target populations to screen right now. That doesn't account for females at risk. It doesn't deal with other issues. So I think that identifying the population is problem number one. And then problem number two is how, how do we screen? And unfortunately, that's currently limited to a very expensive invasive technique, which is high definition upper endoscopy. And that has the obvious limitations of cost, time away from work, uh, and also endoscopic recognition. And we'll talk more about diagnosis in a little bit. But I think that it's a, the only tool we have. There are lots of other things that have been looked at and are being looked at. So on the one hand, we only have one tool right now, which is high definition white light. On the other hand, this is an exciting time because many, many alternative, potentially disruptive technologies are being looked at today. So Gary, although you talked about that population, it becomes a moot point in many of our places where you have open access endoscopy, right? I mean, uh, those patients really don't get referred to you, they're just sent to you. And you just end up screening or doing an upper endoscopy in any or whoever walks through the door pretty much in the endoscopy unit. So I think rather than the gastroenterologist knowing about it, this is more for, I think, the referring physicians or for the primary care docs to do it. How does it work in Europe? Is it the same concept as in the US that anybody can just be referred for an upper endoscopy or do you see the patients first in clinic? Well, people cannot be referred to, uh, to, to, to the hospital for an upper endoscopy anymore. Mm -hmm. It used to be a case. So patients usually go to their primary care physicians and uh, he or she is, is making the decision whether to, to do an endoscopy or not. And that's also, I think, the, uh, the side where you have to go for screening. I mean, th those are the patients at yeah. risk for Barrett's office and that's why we are now developing a program for the first line, uh, first line screening program for Barrett's office. But is that indeed in the population, the, 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 the reflux patients, those that are uh, taking PPIs for a long time, uh, in males, 50s, etc., etc. But is that a is that a policy in the Netherlands? Is that actually established? Do you have guidelines? No, it's not. It's not uh, uh, established yet. That we are actually in, in, the, in the in the front line uh, and trying to develop this because we think there might be a place for for programs like this. And then, of course, uh, well, then the, uh, the, the 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 big issue is how are you going to screen people? Either by upper endoscopy or are you using uh, endosheet uh, technology or are you using uh, cyber sponge, etc., etc., to make it easier and also to be able to do screening outside the, the hospital setting, which also makes it, of course, cheaper mm -hmm. than, do it in, than doing it in the hospital. Yeah, but I think one of the issues, one of the biggest challenges is really can we make this cost effective? Even if you diagnose a lot of individuals with Barrett's esophagus, the vast majority of which will not progress. Sure. So if you institute a screening program, 
is the cost involved actually going to be worth the, the bang for the buck at the end? Right. And, I, and I don't think we have that data at this point. I mean, I think that's why so many of the groups have used very selective targeted populations and the same risk factors that exist for Barrett's that also exists for progression, the obese male patients that smoke and so forth, would obviously be good targets for progressors as well. But uh, that's yeah. why you like to have something which is extremely cheap, right? To yeah. Be able to screen, and that's the problem. I mean, even with all the cyto sponge or the softening cap that you're mm -hmm. using, right? Can at the clinic, I guess, you got some early data on that. I mean, again, I mean, they're all going to be pretty expensive, and they all end up using biomarkers, which for surveillance, as you know, we've been using forever, and none of them have panned out. I mean, I just have a hard time believing that any of these markers right now will work. I think, that, yeah, I think that for screen, though, we're mar using the markers not as, as, as progression markers, but really as identification markers to kind of hone in to make sure that the columnar epithelium is coming from the esophagus and not from the stomach. I think the other point that, that we have to make is that remember that 95% of esophageal cancers patients uh, uh, are not identified in, in surveillance programs. So that's the, the whole rationale for screening is because surveillance only addresses 5% of esophageal cancer, it doesn't address the nine, other 95%, and that's why so much effort has been made. And again, I, th I think these are exciting times because a lot of different, paradigm, uh, different paradigms are being looked at to do this. And I think it, it also behooves us to mention uh, 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 just simple apps. You know, if you can uh, develop a score of people who are, have increased risk, that's been looked at, it's been disappointing, but things are evolving there and becoming more sophisticated, and now with apps that you can plug into an electronic record or to an iPhone, we may be able to target patients better, but we're not there yet. Great. And once those patients are in the endoscopy and getting screened, how can we do a better job diagnosing who has Barrett's esophagus? Uh, so I think the key there is uh, for the gastroenterologist endoscopist to take their time in making a diagnosis. I think landmarks are key. Um, you know, the validated system which we have proposed and is now quite widely accepted are the Prague criteria, which takes into account the circumferential extent and the maximal extent of Barrett's esophagus, and to try to ignore lengths which are less than a centimeter, is the so called irregular Z line or the ultra short, whatever terminology you use, but to sort of like not biopsy those and not call those as Barrett's esophagus. So, um, you know, just like we talk about colonoscopy, we'll probably talk about a little bit also on surveillance and get into uh, inspection time, things related to that. But I think, again, a high quality examination, I think we've focused a lot on colonoscopy and uh, upper endoscopy, unfortunately, has suffered. So I think now it's time to start focusing on quality in upper endoscopy. Pretty, uh, you know, this is, you know, your, your, the prog classification has been around now for over a decade, and yet it seems that at the community level, at least in North America, I can't speak to Europe, this concept of biopsying, of having a Z-line and biopsying it no matter what just won't go away, despite guideline after guideline throughout the world saying hands off. Do you have any thoughts as to why we can't get people to get away from this nasty habit of biopsying a normal appearing Z-line, which everyone calls it irregular, but it's really right. normal. Right, right. No, so that's a good point. I mean, again, in the prog criteria, we really, uh, you know, the push of the paper or the uh, classification was focus on landmarks and grading the columnar epithelium. And somewhere hidden in that was the message about the fact that we have very low inter-observer agreement for lens which are less than a centimeter. So we didn't make a big push in that for not biopsying it, but you're absolutely right. From then onwards, many of the guidelines have actually incorporated that. And uh, I, I think just as uh, endoscopists, we are very sort of resistant to change and it takes a long time for new systems and the whole generation maybe to you know, move along and, uh, you know, people who actually believe in this concept to do it. Uh, the same thing for the Los Angeles classification for erosive esophagitis. It took it a good 20 years before it became standard. And you're, you're talking about the community 
a gastroenterologist in the U.S. not using or not adopting the Prague classification. Many of them still don't adopt the Los Angeles classification for reflux esophagitis, which was published in the late uh, 1990s, you know. So it's, it just takes a while. And I, again, I'm not sure that it's specific to just Prague or to LA. I think that it has to be part of the curriculum, has to be part of the training process and for people to get trained in it. And then I think that's when you'll start seeing that change. But one of the things that a little bit concerns me, because as you were pointing out, these new innovative techniques for screening for Barrett's, if we use a non-endoscopic yeah, yeah. technique that shows up a positive, and then you're asked to do a procedure, you know something's positive, and now all these irregular Z lines are suddenly going to look like one centimeter Barrett segments because you know you have a suspicion something is there. This whole question may resurrect itself like the ugly monster it has been in the past. You may not be able to eradicate that. Do not biopsy the uh, the Z line. Well, I fully agree with this one centimeter issue. I mean, and I, I think that people are still taking biopsies too, too frequently biopsies. At the same time, we all know these patients that have well, one centimeter Barrett's with a early or even advanced lesion into it. And so, and, and when, when I tell people that they should be, well, maybe a little bit more careful in taking biopsies from these short segments, they tell me always these type of stories that they, that they had one, 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 one or two patients and that's uh, mm -hmm. their experience. And I think that's at least one of the reasons why people keep on taking biopsies from these short segments. And, and that goes back to the quality, right? I mean, we're not, you, if you see a lesion, you don't need to have a columnar lined esophagus to take a biopsy, right? If you have a lesion, you can have adenocarcinoma of the gastric cardia without having any parrots at all, right? So mm -hmm. if there's a lesion, you obviously do it. So that's why Peter's point's well taken is in the sense that that's the reason people end up biopsying it, but they forget that those cancers are visible. Uh, and, and so that's a whole different story what we're talking about. But I think Ken is right is, and then that's why I'm, I'm still reserving my opinion and thoughts on these non-endoscopic things because as endoscopists, I like to see, right? What I'm biopsying, what am I uh, brushing? And what would you do if the non-endoscopic test is positive and now your endoscopy is negative? What do you tell the patient? Do they have the disease or not, right? So I think it may end up muddying the waters even more. And, uh, you know, so although Gary mentions that the marker you're looking for is for intestinal metaplasia, right? But you don't want to have like 10 million additional parrots diagnosed in the world without knowing what to do with them. So you need to have the markers of progression also along the same time. Otherwise, how are you going to survey all these patients or should you survey all those patients? And, you know, we're, we're talking about a Barrett's session here, but in all honesty, these devices are designed to screen for gastroesophageal junctional as well as esophageal cancers. So, you know, that's what they're going to do. That's going to be the expectation on the endoscopist to do exactly like you say, to examine more than just the esophagus, but the proximal stomach as well. As we know from the Cancer Genome Atlas, junctional cancers behave and have the same genetic pathogenesis as those that are above it in the, in the uh, Barrett segment. So we probably should treat them the same and probably need to look for them the same. And you'll have to revise the PROG criteria to include the junction. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time, maybe coming back to this, to this issue of having a positive non endoscopic test, Mm -hmm. and then uh, normal uh, and yeah. well, people are used to it in, in, in Europe eh? because mm -hmm. they also they already have this FOBT test for colorectal cancer mm -hmm. and well, there are some quite a few patients that have a, neg uh, they have a positive test and a, and a negative colonoscopy and in most cases they are very relaxed about it I mean, mm -hmm. in fact they are happy so but I, that's I, a different I, I, but that's a little different right that's you're saying that FOBT is just, it's not saying that you have a polyp it's like having one test which says that you have a polyp and then the colonoscopy saying that you don't have a polyp, right? Whereas the FOBT just says that there's blood, right? I mean, it's not saying you have a polyp, so it, it's a little different, but I, I, I hear what you're saying is that uh, in Barrett's we're not used to it and I guess we'll have to get used to it. I, I would guess that the, the perception of the patient is the same. Uh -huh. yeah. no, but we, got, we have Cologuard now, so we, uh -huh. have, we have a genetic test that's telling us there's something serious 
And, you know, that, that has influenced practice because, you know, FOBT positivity, you don't find anything. The endoscopist and the patient doesn't get too nervous because, like Bertik says, there's a lot of false positives. But if the Cologuard test is positive with a genetic marker telling you something really nasty is up there, even Doug Rex says if he does a complete thorough colonoscopy, which, you know, he's a adenoma detection rate of 60% plus, he'll go back and do a second colonoscopy just because he's so afraid he's missing something. And given that, what would you say are the most promising <laughs> non-endoscopic screening devices? I think in the, in the, right now being investigated are a lot of these cytological devices. There's the esophageal device with the balloon that's uh, inflated once the capsule reaches the stomach and then withdrawn. Cytosponge obviously has been well developed in Europe and the UK in particular. Uh, we have a sponge on the string type device, which is very similar to the cytosponge, and they seem to be gaining a lot of traction in terms of usage. Uh, they're very promising. I think, you know, uh, they're all in study. One of the uh, big issues is, you know, is everybody going to like to do those? Because they are easy to do, but they do involve pulling there's definitely the patient notices when these things come up. It's not like they're completely uh, uh, free. And they generally have to be done in some kind of medical environment because you're pulling this device out of someone. Peter and I have used these, uh, these volatile organic compound screening devices where they're looking at breath and smell to try and detect things. Their advantage is you could do them in a shopping mall and in people's businesses. Disadvantages are going to be likely much less specific than a cytological examination. Where all this falls out and what should be used, you know, I think is yet to be determined. You know, certain tests might be very good for general population screening. Certain tests like the sponges might be used in more select higher risk patients. We're not sure, I think, how to apply them at this point, or even you know, how well the data goes. But uh, there is an exciting time with a lot of innovation being spent on this. And of course, uh, as in everything else, the microbiome is an exciting area. Mm -hmm. That's an area that is also being interrogated. Can you detect, I like to use the expression CSI gastro, can you detect uh, an altered microbiome uh, on, on a swab? Again, far out, but uh, I think we have to think outside the box because we haven't really made progress. Transnasal, despite really the excellent work that's been done in Mayo and other places, I just don't see it having legs. People have voted with their feet. They just don't want to do it. And uh, although I heard it's being done in France regularly now, I'm not sure what the take of, uh, uptake of transnasal is in, in, in Europe, uh, Peter. I think every man, every uh, uh, in some places, but it, it's not regularly used at the moment. Well, thank you very much. That will wrap up our session on screening and diagnosis in Barrett's esophagus.